Hello everyone, the next website that I'll be looking at is through earth.nullschool.net. Uh, that is actually their base website, they don't have anything else for it here, it just goes straight to the simulation that we're looking at right now on screen. Uh, I actually use this a lot for my Earth and Space Science classes, this is for a freshman level class at my high school. This is something that I could certainly see apply to a much wider range of students clear up until their senior year, depending on what sort of science class they are in, uh, and then also down into middle school very easily. Uh, anything younger that would be probably pushing it a little bit, but it certainly could fit between middle school and high school very well, uh, both through your science classes, but also environmental classes, or uh, depending on what you're doing as far as uh, engineering project, this could certainly be used there in addition to those others. What I would like to do is just kind of give you an idea of how you can use this in the classroom, or how at least I use it in the classroom, as well as some kind of tips or heads up for things that students might accidentally do uh, or expect to try to be able to figure out. Uh, so for what we're looking at here from the get-go, we are actually looking at wind speeds on Earth. So whenever you see those uh, brighter green lines or those white lines going through, those are going to be our higher wind speeds and then we can start to see here in central United States, those winds are much calmer and we have that blue color instead. One of the nice things about this is that you can actually highlight where you are at using this crosshair at the bottom. So this shows you, I'm in Salina, Kansas, and this says, hey, you're right at this place. Uh, so if you want to come see me at Salina South High School, that's where I'm at. Uh, but it'll actually show you where you're at so you can get an idea of what's going on outside your window. Uh, the other big things that we're starting to look at is you do have a lot of choices between what you're working with, between if we're wanting to talk about uh, the air, if I want to start looking at ocean currents or different chemicals or particulates in the in the atmosphere itself. Uh, one of the cool things that I don't really use a lot in my class is this one that's talking about space. Uh, but you can actually see the aurora borealis or where it would potentially be happening at both poles. Uh, so let me go ahead and refocus on where we are at here currently. Usually I have students focus mostly on the air side of this, and we can talk about how that is going to change if you go up to different elevations. For instance, if you go to take a, a plane ride, how your wind speeds are going to be way different than us clear down here towards the surface of the Earth. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that it ties in extremely well to weather maps. A lot of times students, when they're looking at a weather map, they kind of have this disconnect of what they're seeing and what's actually happening outside. Uh, and this is a great way to kind of show what would be going on. And as they get better at it, they can actually just look at this uh, information right here and get an idea of what's going on in the United States. For instance, if I'm glancing at this, I would expect these areas where wind is rushing towards, so right here with this swirl, there's going to be a low pressure area there. Same thing down here towards southern Texas and north, uh, excuse me, north Mexico, that's going to have a low pressure area, and then probably up here towards the Great Lakes in addition to those others. Uh, high pressure I'd expect to see here in the middle, where we have uh, more clear skies where you wouldn't have as much wind. And there looks like there's probably some lower pressure here as well. And the nice thing about it is that even as you flip through other things, so if I flip over to temperatures now, I can see that start to fit up. For instance, this here between the orange and the yellow, that most likely is a cold front. So if that's a cold front, I would expect to see some storms. And if I move on over to relative humidity, I see that, well, that matches with it. There's more moisture in the air there compared to what its limit, and it's probably more likely to be raining or storming there. Similarly speaking, over here on the side, a lot drier air, so not nearly as likely to have that happening. And it looks like up here towards uh, Maine and towards Canada, not where I would like to be. Uh, and you do have a lot of other options as well. Those are the big ones that I have my students look at. That as well as how you can actually change the dates. So as I'm going through these, it'll actually change the time on here for each of the smaller ones that I'm clicking right now. I can also uh, choose a date that I would like to jump back to. So if I go back a couple of weeks, I can say... Uh, let's see, there was supposed to be a blizzard in Kansas here a couple weeks ago, so let me go back to about that date, and we can start to see how strong that movement was and how much is being involved with that. And of course, I could go back to wind or even the temperatures, and there we go, we can see how much cooler it was back a couple weeks ago. 
Uh, and students always like to take that and, of course, apply it to what's going to be happening in the future. So today is the 24th. A lot of times we'll have them check out, well, what's my weekend plans? What's that going to look like here for Saturday? And we start to get the idea of our temperatures aren't bad, a little bit on the windier side, uh, lower pressure coming through, so it might be starting to rain later on. But it's a cool way to kind of think about weather forecasting without just the L's and the H's moving around. Uh, it's it's really interesting to see them be able to pick up on that. Uh, one other thing that I have them look at, since I know I'm running long on time already, uh, one of the things I have them look at is actually pollution within our atmosphere itself. And there's two different places you can look at that with. One is through chemicals. You can talk about uh, carbon monoxide and how that's being a, a, an effect of different cities and anything along those lines. You can look at CO2 as well as, uh, oh, come on. I hope that this, oh, we have no data. That's what's going on here. Uh, so that's one that I have them look at compared to the United States to other places that we know has very obviously a lot of pollution. And we can also look at particulates and how that's going to change. So particulates, just different things, solids floating through the atmosphere. SO4 is a good example of that. But even looking at this, we can see kind of a similar thing what we saw with the carbon monoxide how there's different uh, higher parts at larger cities and one thing I always have my students notice or a lot of times they point out to me in fact is that okay we have a lot of pollution going on here but it doesn't just stop here and it's certainly not contained here either we see it starting to drift out in the sea we have this pocket here in the Pacific Ocean where well, there's no cities there. It's just an effect of wind patterns and how that's moving around. And it really opens their eyes to just how much what we do here on Earth is affecting not just our immediate environment, but even people half a globe away. Uh, so, like I said, this is something that I really enjoy using. I know I've talked about it for a lot already. Uh, it's something that I could use a lot more in class as well. Uh, so it's really just the sky is the limit for one of these. Uh, and it's just how you want to implement it within your classroom. Thanks.